Good morning and welcome to the Cosmic Shambles Family Science Club. It's Saturday morning again and we have lots of things for you, bubbles and animals and astronomy and all kinds of stuff. Um, so, so welcome along. This morning, oh, a special reminder, if you've got questions as you're going along, we do have lots of live feeds. So however you're watching us, uh, there will be a live feed attached to it somewhere. And if there isn't, there's always Twitter. So if you've got any questions as, you're, as we're going along, do please ask us. Uh, this is just one of the Cosmic Shambles Stay at Home Festival things. There are loads of things going on. Robin and Josie are doing morning shows every week. There's evening comedy. We've got a science question and answer session tomorrow. So if you've got big science questions, uh, we'll have me and Robin and Adam Rutherford and Lucy Cook all online at 3 p.m. tomorrow on Sunday to answer as many of your questions as we can get through. We can't promise to answer all of them, but we'll do our very best. And um, yeah, oh, the tip jar, yes, very important. So somewhere, however you're watching, probably below, there'll be something about an online tip jar. And if you are able, um, either before or during, or after you watch the show, if you could bung a couple of quid in there, we'd really appreciate it. It doesn't go to us. Where it goes is to um, arts venues that are really struggling while they can't put on performances. And there are a lot of them around the country. We have made donations, our second batch of donations in this last week, and they have gone to the Pound Arts Centre in Corsham, uh, the Witham Arts Centre in Barnard Castle, and the One in Twelve Club in Bradford. And those are the sorts of places that you would see Cosmic Shambles performers. Uh, they're all small venues, and we really think it's important, you know, that all, lo lots of things are very weird at the moment, but we can't lose the culture we have. And so we're trying very hard to support those struggling venues. So if you can, if you are able, uh, please do bung a little bit in the tip jar and it will go directly to those causes. So we are going to get on with this morning now. And uh, I'm going to start with one of my favourite bubble things, which is simple to do, but um, endlessly entertaining. And the best thing is that once I've got it going, it will keep going through the whole show so we can keep checking on it. Um, so what I've got here is a bottle of fizzy stuff. So the British call it lemonade it's never had a lemon anywhere near it nobody nobody else calls it lemonade but anyway fizzy stuff bottle of and also um raisins and now you can experiment with this because um anything that's raisin like will do a good job but you so currants and sultans and things are great you can you can experiment with different things so to get all this going um i'm going to show you it first and then explain so here's my bottle i'm going to take the lid off oh <laughs> <laughs> try not to spray it all over so you can see there's little bubbles coming up I'm going to let it off gas a little bit and then um, I'm going to take my raisins and drop them everywhere <laughs> apparently they are going all over my laptop and all over everything and you can see there's a lot of fizzing oh yeah everything's chosen <laughs> I do have a towel down here I did think about that this might happen right so I'm, I'm going to keep on stuffing in raisins well, what you can see here is that the raisins are dancing and I'm going to keep putting them in because um, why not? So you need to keep the lid off. That's the only thing. Right. That is probably. I mean, it's just a good game. I can keep doing this for hours. So I'm going to hold now it's stopped fizzing. I'm going to hold this right up to the camera. So what you can see is that the raisins are rising and falling. Um, and oh, I'm dripping on my laptop a bit. Don't don't do that. So <laughs> you can see there's some at the bottom that are just sitting there down there and every so often one from the bottom escapes and waiting for one to escape and it will rise up there one goes uh up to the top and then it will sit at the top for a bit and then it'll turn around and it will roll all the way back down to the bottom so what you get is this ballet dance of raisins rising and falling and it's endless fun so uh what's going on here now this is a it's a really important process actually i'm a big fan of bubbles and what these raisins are doing is basically growing themselves a life jacket. So in the bottle, before I opened it, there was mostly water and there was loads of extra gas in it. So someone had pressurised it to push gas so it dissolved into the water. So when I opened the lid, there's all this extra gas in the water. And you could see at the start, some of it started to come out and form bubbles, but not all of it. There's plenty left in there. And the thing about bubbles is, what they need to start is a rough surface. And that's why the insides of bottles like this are always super smooth. It's because there's loads of gas in there. But if it hasn't got, if it's only got smooth surfaces, there's nowhere that that gas can kind of get started on being a bubble. And so what the raisins are is 
wrinkly. <laughs> Um, this is one for the for the fans of wrinkles in life. So raisins are full of little rough notches um, that each have a little bit of gas trapped down the bottom. And as they fall down to the bottom, a raisin is more dense than the water. And then once it's down here, that little rough surface, that is a place where a bubble can get started. So bubbles are growing on all of these raisins at the bottom. They're growing themselves life jackets. And when they've grown enough so that the raisin plus its life jacket is less dense than the water, then they rise up to the top. And then at the top, they turn over and they get rid of all their bubbles and then the raisin goes all the way back down. So this, I'm going to leave this going. It's going to, it'll keep doing its little dance for, for about half an hour. And the important thing about this is that this is, you know, it's um, bubble nucleation. That's what we call this. You need a place to nucleate a bubble, a little place to get started. And this is the reason, for example, that you shouldn't ever or you should be very careful if you heat up milk in the microwave and it's almost boiling. If you take it out and then put a spoon in it, sometimes the whole thing erupts and it boils and it's dangerous because it can put hot water all over your hand. Um, and it's the same process. The inside of the mug is smooth. You've just heated this liquid up. It's now superheated. It's got loads of gas that would like to escape. And as soon as you put a spoon in, you give it a place to go. So you suddenly get this fountain of bubbles. And as they rise out, they drag all the hot liquid with them. So, it's, so that is a reason... So I recommend you do the lemonade experiment, but not the microwave experiment because it's hot and you might burn yourself. Anyway, so there's lots of there's lots of games to play with bubbles and nucleation, but that that's my favourite one. Now I have raisins and um, water everywhere. <laughs> okay. So uh, we're going to get started. So I recommend having a play with that later. Uh, we're going to get started with our two guests today. And we first of all, we're going to hear from Simon Watt, who is a biologist who does all, all sorts of interesting things. Um, he is he was the founder of the Ugly Animal Preservation Society. So because they need preserving, they matter, too. And uh, he's got a website called Ready Study Science. He does lots of science performance and um, events and all that kind of thing. So, Simon. Over to you, Simon. Over to you. Hey, everyone. Can you hear me? It's nice to be online with the Cosmic Chandel's crew. It's uh, we're definitely in a weird, weird time, and I don't know if, like, like many of you out there, if we're stuck at home, we might be looking to acquire some new skills. And I've got a four-year-old and a two-year-old to try and keep entertained, so I've been doing my absolute best. Um, now, normally, a lot of my talks and things are about zoology. I get to go out there and sometimes do TV shows where we look at some incredible animals and things. We sometimes get to get up close and personal with some of nature that we otherwise wouldn't get to. And I, I don't get to do that in my house. So I'm being forced to improvise. I've been trying to learn how to do a little bit of balloon modeling. So I'm going to try and recreate maybe some of the ugly animals for you because the things which are pretty and cute, we already know enough about. The things which are kind of a bit more in every single natural history documentary. Um, the things which look good in blue chip rather than a bit hideous, we all know about already. So my first thing that I want to talk to you about, I'm going to have to blow this up. I'm going to have to do my absolute best at working on this. Let's see. Whoops. That will happen. You've been warned. Uh, one moment. Now, I've, I've been practicing this, um, you know, day in, day out, especially for this live stream. And... Uh, uh -huh. Right, another one. Uh -huh. Okay. All right. I know what you're thinking when you look at this. You're thinking that this is a snake. Yeah? No, no, it's not. This uh, It looks an awful lot like a snake, but this is what we call a slow alert worm. Now, we do find slow worms in the UK. They can be up to maybe 45 centimetres. That's as much as you get. The females tend to be a little bit bigger. Um, over half of their body or thereabouts is their tail. You can't really tell the difference, can you? Um, they can live for about 30 years. And this is an example of what we call a legless lizard. Now, your parents are probably just thinking that's what we call a lizard that's gone to the pub for a little while. But there's over 200 different species of legless lizards out there. They look an awful lot like snakes, but they're fundamentally different. These have lost their legs in a completely different way. We think this has happened at least 25 times within the lizard family. It seems kind of careless that you'd lose your, your, your legs, but like, well, I'm, I'm losing things down the back of the sofa all the time. Who knows what's down there? I've got a feeling one of these days I'll go in with a hoover and come out with the holy grail. 
Now, they can shed their skin a bit like uh, snakes in a hole, but more commonly, they'll actually just shed them in bits, a bit like the other lizards. If you were to look inside a slow worm, you can see that they're fundamentally different from the snakes. Snakes, to try and pack their organs into that long, skinny body, end up having one lung, which is much, much smaller than the other one. Whereas we've got our, our organs kind of packed in that we'll have one here and one here and they exist in pairs, snakes and long skinny things like the slow worm have them kind of in sequence instead. So we have a kidney here and a kidney here, a snake has a kidney here and a kidney here. We've got one lung here, one lung here, and they're roughly the same size, one slightly smaller because our heart is asymmetrical, a bit bigger on one side than the other one, but they're roughly the same. If you look at a snake, one of the lungs is much smaller and one of the lungs is big and long and goes all the way down the length of its body. If you look at the slow worm and the other legless lizards, the lungs are roughly the same size. So that was my, my first animal. I'm now going to try and recreate another one here for you. Hopefully this one won't pop. Oh, crumbs. You can tell that these were packed away in my, in my pugs. And... Uh, I hope I'm not giving anybody a heart attack at home. Okay, now a little bit of twisting. Give me just one second. I'll make this. It's really, really biologically accurate, this one. Okay. Uh, okay, and now here what we have. I know what you're thinking. That looks a lot like a slow worm. Um, but no, this is in fact a worm lizard. A whole different type of the lizard family, which again has got no legs. Now, most of them are about six inches long. There are about 190 ones. Again, these are fundamentally different. They don't have legs. Um, the slow worm's a bit different from the snake because it can give you a wink. Snakes have got a special scale over their eye, what we call a uh, spectacle, where slow worms have got proper eyelids and can wink back at you. These guys, the worm lizards, they don't have eyelids either. They just have an extra sort of covering that goes all the way over, a bit of skin. So they're mostly a bit blind, and it's because most of them live underneath the ground. They look an awful lot like earthworms because they live a life a bit like an earthworm. They've got a skull, which is a lot more reinforced, and they use it a bit like a battering ram. They get way the way through the soil. Uh, these ones, again, are fundamentally different from the snakes because if you dissect them, and, you know, dissections in these cases are a bit loud, you can look in and see that their lungs are the opposite of something a bit like the snake. The snake has got a left lung, which is much, much smaller, and a right lung, which is massive. These worm lizards have got right lungs, which are tiny, and left lungs, which are really, really long. Okay, I'm going to give you another one. I'm going to try and uh, blow this up right here. Now, this one, I think, you're, oh, you're thinking that looks an awful lot like a, a worm lizard. Is that right? No, this is a, this is a Sicilian, okay? And there's over 200 types of Sicilian. Again, they can resemble worms. They can resemble snakes. Um, the biggest ones are about one meter and a half long. Um, but these also lack limbs completely. And, and they're not even lizards. These aren't like the snakes or the worm lizards or the legless lizards. These are actually amphibians. They're a relative of the salamanders, which again, live underground and therefore have evolved to be completely different. Moist skin though, that the amphibians have means that their life is fundamentally different. They tend to have lungs inside them, which are an awful lot like the snakes, but some of them don't have lungs at all because they can breathe entirely through their skin. My favorite group of the Sicilians is one called the Sagala Sicilian, and it uses its skin for a completely different reason. It uses it to feed its babies. It basically is highly nutritious, fatty eczema, so that it sort of shreds the skin and the babies which are writhing around on it and eating something equivalent of milk as well, they will then start nom-nomming their way all over the skin. Um, if you've ever seen those like weird places where people go and dip their feet in and the fish will come along and, and eat their athlete's foot or whatever, these babies are doing their mum that all the way over their body. So that's pretty cool. Um, because we're uh, running out of time, I'm gonna do one final one for you because I know that we're, we're tight for time. And if you've got any questions, feel free and we'll ask them eventually. Oh, crumbs. Uh, okay, one moment. Ah, made a giraffe. Um, but they're a bit boring, so I don't really want to talk about those because they're mammals. Who cares? It's been lovely talking with you all. 
Thank um, you, Murphy. I'm glad to see that there is balloon modelling that even I am capable of. You know, I've always wondered where a snake's organs are. I did ask a biologist once where they all were, and they didn't know. So I am glad that you finally answered my question. Um, so uh, while people are, are we, we've got a question for you. Have you got a yes. question? Go on. When, tell us what the question is. Someone, someone sent you a question, or have you seen the question? Oh, I can't see anything, I'm afraid. Oh. No, tell me. Oh, it's on WhatsApp. So while you have a think about that, um, while people, oh, are, so are eels and sea snakes worms or snakes or fish? That's the question. So eels are so eels are a type of fish, and actually the kind of um, the word we use is eliform. So basically eel-like. And if you think about an elephant, even it's a bit eel-like and so named because of its big long snout. Eels are long and skinny. They do, in fact, have fins, but they're vastly reduced. And if you really want to see something even weirder than an eel, look up uh, elvers, the baby eels. And they look a bit more like eels that have been squished. And they're lovely and flat and see-through. For the things which are truly limbless that you find in the water and that are fish, it's actually really, really ancient fish. So things like a lamprey or a hagfish, they're what we call the agnathans. They evolved long before chins came along, basically. And a hagfish, in fact, I've got a photo of one right here in my book. Hagfish have got incredible teeth. They're not like ours because they don't have jaws that they can go munching with. Instead, it's a bit like an orbital sander and they kind of latch on to a prey and then spin round and round and round and grit the prey up. They eat things like dead whales, properly disgusting lifestyle. And if you can chew, it means you've got to deal with this in a very, very different way. So they find something that's kind of nice and decomposing. They sort of shred it up with their mouths and then they'll dive head first into that carcass because they can actually absorb more nutrients through their skin than they can through their digestive system. So like if you've ever been to, I don't know, like to an all you can eat buffet and the gravies looked so nice that you wished you could just dive in, hagfish actually could and they'd be able to feed that way. So that's one of those eliform fish. The eels and lots of other things have evolved to be long and skinny too, but they're not limbless the way that something like a hagfish is. Sorry, so that was the eels. What was the other I one? Think, that they wanted oh, to well, sea snakes. I think you've sort of covered under marine things. That, so sea snakes as well. So Very sea brilliant. snakes are still reptiles. They're just highly specialized snakes. They still breathe oxygen. Um, they still breathe it through the air, not the way that, say, the fish can and breathe it through their gills. The really cool thing about sea snakes, though, is partly because they live under the water and they can have their venom dissipating and being diffused out and losing it and with all that water sloshing around. They are some of the most venomous animals on the planet. Sea snakes are properly dangerous. If we're to consider the most dangerous things in the sea other than the sea itself, well, self, 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 other than the sea itself, you could probably say that sea snakes are up there. That was worth, worse than um, she sells seashells on the seashore wasn't it <laughs> it's a saturday morning yeah so there are there are loads of that is brilliant things without legs there you go really interesting and i would say if you ever do meet a hagfish don't touch it because what they do is produce oodles of slime in the most thoroughly disgusting way and uh, which is probably something to do with digestion i don't know but i have seen hagfish slime and it is oh, not properly icky not, not quite digestion it's it's um, a tactic for avoiding predators so it's, something it's like, like it's like something out of a horror movie. It's kind of this really gloopy, thick. Anyway, that's probably that's probably enough snake-like stuff for a uh, Saturday morning. So very briefly, Simon, while people are uh, still inside, have you got recommendations for things that they can see or do if they'd like to know more about ugly animals or icky snake-like things or anything else like things or anything else? Well, okay, as, as this is like for families mostly, I did an Earth uh, Earth Lesson Live, which is a project being run by Lizzie Daly. And if you look up that, you can see me talking about some more of the ugly animals. And um, for the adults and the kids, if they're up late enough, uh, Johnny Berliner, who's also frequently on this channel, and I are doing a pub quiz tomorrow. It's an anarcho-nerd one. It's all a bit weird where knowing stuff doesn't always help you. Um, it's called Universally Challenged. We're online tomorrow. Check it out. Um, if you're the men for something a little bit more meditative horror, so probably more for your parents and the adults out there, uh, I have a weird sort of one-man headphone horror show which i've adapted to do via zoom now all these things are free feel free to sign up for them but if you like it a bit like the way this is all for good causes i'm putting all my money towards crisis because staying at home is hard it's even harder if you don't have a home 
Thank you very much, Simon. Uh, no shortage of things to play and look at. There so many things on this planet. We're going to move out of this world. Uh, and our next guest is Sheila Kanani, who is an expert in um, outreach and education at the Royal Astronomical Society. She did her PhD studying Saturn. She knows all kinds of things about the planets and astronomy. Uh, and I think she's going to be talking about rockets this morning. Sheila, over to you. Sheila, over to you. Good morning. Thank you so much for having me today. It's um. It's really interesting, this lockdown business, because I've been thinking about it kind of like being an astronaut on the way to Mars, perhaps. It would take about two years to get to Mars, and during that time, you couldn't leave your spacecraft, and you'd be stuck with the people that you were with. Pretty similar to being stuck with your family during lockdown, I think. Um, and to get to Mars, you'd need a rocket. So today, I'm going to show you how to make a rocket using items that you've hopefully got at home. So you will need some kind of a heat proof mat. I've got a ceramic plate here. Um, don't use a plastic plate or a metal plate or a paper plate. Please use a ceramic one or a, some other heat proof item that you might have. You need a pair of scissors. You need some matches or a lighter. And of course, please um, use an adult's help when you use those matches. And then you need a tea bag. Now you do need one of these types of tea bags with the staple in the top. So if you don't have those, you might want to put those on your list when your adult next goes shopping. And what you have to do to start with is cut the top off the tea bag, nice and straight. And you'll see why in a moment. So cut the top off the tea bag. And then you can use the tea if you want to, or you can just dump it, which is what I'm going to do. So I'm just emptying out the tea from the tea bag. And what you'll see, you're left with. Now, as you've cut it nice and straight, then your cylinder will be able to stand up on your heat proof mat. I'm just going to move my screen down a little bit so that you can see you've got your cylinder of your tea, ba tea bag sitting on your heat proof mat. And if you miss it, don't worry, I will do this demo twice then you have to with the help of an adult light the top of the tea bag or the cylinder now I'm not very good at lighting matches well, there we go try and light it evenly and five four three two one lift off um, I can't move my screen to show you what's happened but the tea bag has floated up off into the ceiling and it actually it is floating back down now i'm just going to try and catch it there we go we have our tea bag rocket and what's happening there is you've actually created a convection current um, so you might have heard the phrase hot air rises and that's exactly what's happening you've got your tea bag cylinder you light it at the top and the hot air, uh, the hot, the flames actually heat the air inside the cylinder and the air starts to get heated and agitated and the air molecules start to move about really really fast and this means they spread out so the air inside the tea bag becomes really um really hot really moving around loads and loads and it becomes less dense than the um than the air outside of the tea bag and this hot air starts to rise and the cool air rushes in to take its place and then when the hot air has risen and used up all its energy it then falls back down and you've created what we call a convection current. At the same time, this tea bag is um, burning into an ash and the ash is very light and can be taken up into the air in the form of your tea bag rocket by your convection current. So I'm just gonna do it again now that we know what's going on. So staple tea bag, cut the top off. Didn't cut it very straight this time, so that's gonna be interesting. Dump the tea out. Ooh and you are left with your cylinder. Open the cylinder out, put it on the plate, and then light it. Okay. There we go. Try and light it on both sides. And so, the hot air is starting to rise, the cooler air is coming in, taking the ashy tea bag <laughs> up into the sky and the really cool thing is because the ash does start to uh, because the hot air does start to cool it brings the um it brings the ash back down and you can catch it on your plate last time i tried this the ash actually stuck to my ceiling i've got an ashy mark now on my ceiling so um i'm i've 
you know, that shouldn't happen when you do it at home because I'm in the basement and the ceiling's not very high. There are other um, convection currents in, in the world. Um, and actually, this convection current isn't appropriate for taking human beings to Mars. Rockets that take astronauts into space and other things into space don't use convection currents. But we do use convection currents to get um, hot air balloons into space. So imagine the hot air balloon, it's got a burner underneath it, the burner heats the air inside the balloon and the air becomes less dense inside the balloon and rises up and you go off on your hot air adventure. Other convection currents um, on the Earth include in the oceans, um, plate tectonics in the atmosphere when you have thunderstorms and um, with novelty items at home like lava lamps. And if you don't have your staple, a staple tea bag um, at home, what you could do is create, create a convection current using even more simple ingredients. You need a bit of food coloring and some water and a glass. So you mix your food coloring into some water and then you freeze it. So you've got a nice blue or purple or orange or pink colored um, ice cube. And then you get a glass full of warm water and you float your colored um, ice cube on top and the warm water melts the ice cube. And the water obviously coming from the ice cube is cold. And in the same way you can get convection currents with air and gas, you can get convection currents with liquid and the cold dense water sinks down to the bottom of the glass and the warm water then brings the colour up because the hot, air, uh, hot water or warm water rises in the same way that hot air rises and you actually can see your convection current in your, um, in your glass at home. So you could pretend that that was a magic trick for someone at home but it's not magic, it's physics which is the best thing about it. Thank you. That's brilliant, Sheila. I um, Yeah, I, I'm going to be trying that as soon as I find a tea bag of the right shape and size. I would emphasise that it's probably a good idea to anyone trying at home not to do that anywhere where um, the ceiling is particularly close or valuable. <laughs> so maybe it's a windy day today, certainly here in London. So maybe it's not a day to do it outside. But yes, floating things on fire might not make you, make you very popular. But that is a brilliant thing to have a go at. I once actually discovered, um, you might have seen some of the things, Sheila. I once did a, um, a demonstration for a lecture I was giving that had a small thing I'd covered in ink. And I put it in a bottle of shampoo that was transparent. It was really gloopy. And the... As my off my office was really poorly insulated, so it heated up and cooled down every night. And I realised that it was heating at the bottom. And over the course of three weeks, you could see the ink from the the round thing rising through the shampoo and oh, moving right. down the side. So your shampoo bottles might all have these really slow convection currents inside them, um, even if you're when you're not looking at them, just if they're heating and cooling. So that is that's fabulous, Sheila. I love that. Um, so. Tell us a little bit about what's going on for people, you know, who can't go out. What what do you, what activities do you what recommend? Do you, what activities do you recommend? Well, we're really lucky actually in the space industry because even though we are on lockdown, hopefully everyone still has access to the sky and there are some fantastic things happening in the next few months in the sky. Hopefully going to be able to see an, uh, a comet with the visible eye. Um, there are meteor showers. Some of the planets are going to be visible. There's going to be um, summer constellations and asterisms visible as well. So that's the, the great thing about space. It is accessible to everyone, even during these times. Um, at the Royal Astronomical Society, it's our 200th anniversary. We had obviously, we're having to postpone a lot of the real, real life ones, but we have taken a lot of things online. So I'm running running online um, fun classes for preschool, primary and secondary school students every week. Um, there's public lectures, there's quizzes, there's all kinds of stuff. If you have a look at our websites and Twitter and all, all of that kind of thing, then all of the information is there. Brilliant. So go and look at the Royal Astronomical Society for that. Now we have a question from Zach uh, that was asked on via one of the online routes and the, this is a good question so we know that when we're looking at the potential for life in the rest of our solar system the planets themselves aren't really the place to look it's their moons and Zach's question is which moon of Saturn and it's got a lot <laughs> which moon of Saturn do you think is most likely to have to have had life on it or to have life on it now okay okay well I'm 
I'm really glad this question has been asked because it gets it allows me to talk about my favourite moon in the whole solar system. And um, having studied Saturn and its rings and its moons, like you said, there are a lot of moons. And there's two that really um, stick out. There's Titan, which is one of the biggest moons in the solar system. And it has rivers and lakes and probably rainbows. But the liquid in the rivers and the lakes and the seas is not water. It's actually liquid methane, which is a gas on the Earth. And that's interesting to us because a lot of um, methane is produced by biological um, uh, biological events on the on the Earth. But my favourite moon has to be Enceladus. It's a tiny little moon. It's about the size of England. And if Saturn was the size of a double decker bus, Enceladus would be about your thumbnail size. So really, really tiny. It's covered in ice. It's got an ice crust. And at the South Pole, there are cracks in the in the ice. And there's geysers of material spewing out. And um, Cassini, the spacecraft that spent almost 14 years at Saturn, flew through those plumes of material and measured what they what they were. And there, it's it's water ice. There's ammonia. There's um, there's nitrogen. There's carbon. And the water is salty. And mathematical models and other models have shown us that under the ice there is a salty water ocean on Enceladus. So if we could go to Enceladus, drill through the ice and float about in that salty water ocean. I would, I'm not a betting person, but I would put money on there being some sort of life on that moon of, um, that, on that moon of Saturn. It would probably be microbial life. It would be like an extremophile, some kind of tiny little bug maybe that could survive that kind of environment. But that is where I reckon that there, there's life on uh, it, within our solar system, but not on Earth. And I'm as a, as a fan of the oceans. I'm permanently excited that there are oceans on it's other worlds and that um, they're still exciting on other places. In fact, I think people appreciate oceans more on other planets than they do on ours. But that's a separate rant. Just um, from a biological point of view, Simon, what when you think about life on other planets, what what sort of things do you think might exist? What do we have any idea? You know, if you could invent an alien life form you'd like to see, what would it be? What would it be? Well. There's a whole principle in evolutionary biology that we call convergent evolution. And it's pretty much what happens when things live in similar kind of environments or are kind of having to deal with similar problems that sometimes, although nature can be very resourceful and come up with lots of different solutions, they hit upon the same solution. So actually this, funny enough, links back to all our legless lizards and snakes and legless amphibians earlier. They're all kind of doing the same kind of thing because they're occupying the same niches, doing the same kind of jobs. So if we're going to think about what the universe is like, we have to just look what the commonalities are like. So I think if we did find any kind of complicated alien, not, not just a single sort of cellular stuff, I reckon we'll probably have eyes, because light is one of those things we find very, very commonly through the universe. And perhaps even more likely, I think it'll have some kind of skeleton, because gravity is the kind of big universality of the universe. So I reckon if we're going to find something in these deep seas, and they're going to be... You know they've been there for a long time, so let's imagine evolution has had a bit of a bit of a, a while to get going, and they've had that diversity, and it's changed from just things that are a bit like bacteria to things that are bigger. If they get big enough, they're going to need some kind of skeleton. Now it might not be like ours. It might not be in the inside. It could be something like a crab, where the skeleton's in the outside. It might be something a bit like what we see in worms, where they use a skeleton of just pressurized water. They hold the water in little sacks, or even in some cases, air stuff like that. So I reckon the most likely thing is if we find life, it'll probably have a skeleton of some kind. It may have eyes of some kind. I would love to know more than anything else, is especially when it comes to ocean things, is how much like fish they will look. Because obviously one of the most famous examples of convergent evolution is sharks and dolphins. A shark oh. is a fish and it's kind of shark shaped and a dolphin is a mammal, a completely separate branch of the evolutionary tree, came from something that walked about on land and then moved into the ocean. And the, the only significant difference is that um, you can tell that the dolphin is a mammal because it has a tail that's that way and the shark has a tail that's that way. But lots of other things about their shape are so similar because they've had to solve the same problem. So maybe all the... Um, the sci-fi writer's imaginations will be justified and actually the first thing we'll find on an alien ocean will be a shark. <laughs> we can add another extra layer of coolness to that sort of torpedo shape that you're talking about of the shark and the, uh, the dolphin, which is if you look at the ichthyosaurs, these relatives of the dinosaurs, reptiles that went back to the sea. If you look at the fossils, the first thing that hits you at a glance is you look at it and say, that's a dolphin. 
that looks so, so like a dolphin. But sure enough, the mammals, as you say, we bend like that. Uh, if you look at the fish, they tend to bend more like that. And if you look at the reptiles and you see them kind of stomping across the land, most of them tend to bend a bit more like that as well. So sure enough, the ichthyosaurs, the fossils, the fossils bend more like sharks, but they just look like so, so like dolphins. It's just that exact same principle. But we still have to acknowledge that all of life on Earth came from one single origin. So we've probably got much, much more in common than we realize. Like so much of the machinery that's been built into us is just the very basics for being alive, never mind this complex stuff of getting around inside an ocean. Brilliant. And finally, just quickly, Sheila, if you had, you to, had to choose a type of complex life, so something that's a bit bigger than a worm, what would you like to see on another planet? In your, If you could, you know... Let the, imagination Let the imagination run free. If it was something that we were kind of um, familiar with, I I quite like the idea of aliens coming from octopus or an octopus type species. I just think they're such incredible creatures. They're so smart and they're so clever and they can change colour and they have, you know, all these different things that, and they're so different to human beings. Um, and you know they can escape from their tanks and all of this exciting stuff but I just imagine that the aliens could be kind of octopus like which I think would be really fun I, I approve of your answer because I've spent years Definitely saying not. that alien life uh, we've already got it we've met it it looks like an octopus anyway and anyone who wants the uh, the full discussion about octopuses there will be some of that in Sea Shambles which is coming up on the 17th of May the online show that's going to replace our live show at the Royal Albert Hall so look out for that on May 17th now we're going to finish with a song from Johnny Berliner um, and he will be singing about the physics of electricity just before we get to his song a few little bits of housekeeping obviously we'll be back here next saturday uh, with a different set of guests if you've got questions for us or demos you'd like us to do send them along and we'll see what we can do so we'll be back next saturday at 11 a.m we have the science question and answer session tomorrow live at 3 p.m me robin ince um adam rutherford and lucy cook so send your questions along uh, um for that oh next saturday i have just been told by trent that bobby siegel and Ginny smith will be with us next week here on the family science club uh do oh and tomorrow with the question and answers it's hedgehog it's a hedgehog day for some reason it's hooray for hedgehogs so there will also be hedgehogs and do subscribe to the cosmic shambles youtube channel if you'd like to be kept up to date on everything that we do there's also loads of stuff on the website there's blogs and all kinds of things um and I think that is, oh, don't forget the tip jar. Last thing, very important. Don't forget the tip jar somewhere below this. And to play us out, um, Johnny Berliner has a website called SciTunes where you can find more of this stuff. But for now, here is Johnny Berliner on the physics of electricity. Let's talk electricity. It makes the lights shine. It gets you one line powers, kettles for your tea. When you talk about the charge in a circuit, you mean electrons that are free. My brothers, sisters, and me, physicists will agree that a coulomb will be about six billion billion of us. That's a big family. We are electrons getting pushed around in a wire. If we get faster, all there's more of us. Our current is higher. Potential difference is the reason that we are a flowing, but we get stuck. We stop flowing if that circuit is broken. Currents the rate that we flow The number of us that go Charge over time on coulomb per second Is one that we know And the reason that we move is We're getting pushed to do this By negative charge and pull to positive charges But you knew this We're always working as a team To transfer energy The joules transferred per coulomb Is the potential difference PD Yo, it is measured in volts So the work done is Q times V If volts go higher than our current increases We are in Getting pushed around in a wire If we get faster, all oh, there's more of us Our current is higher Potential difference is the reason That we are a-flowing But we get stuck, we stop flowing If that circuit is broken We get obstructed though Yeah, we collide as we go With the ions in the wire Which heats up, that's why a bug glows So we make a ratio between PD and current flow V equals I times R Which is resistance measured in ohms You can keep resistance low By making wires wider All made of copper There are more electrons free inside them If you keep your wires cool I'll keep them shorter too We collide less with the ions And glide right through we are electrons getting pushed around in a wire If we get faster all oh, there's more of us Our current is higher 
potential difference is the reason that we are a flowing but we get stuck we stop flowing if that circuit is broken when we're pushed by the mains our current alternates but we flow in one direction when a cell's the one to blame a dial stops our flow if the wrong way we should go and fixed resistors make my sisters and my brothers slow since the circuits are made with the misters and ldrs they change resistance when there's a change in line and temperature and if you want to fade or turn up the volume then use variable resistors to control our flowing right away we are electrons getting pushed around in a wire if we get faster or there's more of us our current is higher potential difference is the reason that we are a flowing but Stuck, we stop flowing if that circuit is broken When we're in series, we're on a single loop Resistances get added and we flow the same the whole way through When we're in parallel, there's more than one group There's more of us to flow so we can transfer more energy to The rate that we transfer the energy E over T is power P, it also equals IV And what about safety? When I get too lively Earth me, insulate my wires, use a fuse to stop me We are electrons getting pushed around in a wire If we get faster or there's more of us, our current is higher Potential difference is the reason that we are a flowing But we get stuck, we stop flowing if that circuit is broken We are electrons getting pushed around in a wire Faster, oh, there's more of us, our current is higher